So you seem to have a real focus on the blue lamp in the excerpt of the hard crowd that I got to read in the New Yorker. And I personally really relate to how certain bars um, can be really vital for a neighborhood and how the scenes that grow out of those places really foster community that can bring joy and also be real lifelines for people. So what did the blue lamp specifically mean to the Tunderland community? And um, as you kind of say in the hard crowd, what place did this bar hold in the informal Tenderloin circuit? I describe working at the Blue Lamp uh, as a bartender in two of the essays that are in my new book, The Hard Crowd, the title essay and another essay called Not With The Band uh, that's about bartending at various live music venues all around San Francisco. Um, I worked at the Warfield and Fillmore and the Great American Music Hall and um, the Longshoreman's Hall, um, the Trocadero, which was also uh, for a period of time called The Bridge, a bunch of different places that once you're in that circuit of doing live music, you get asked to do this, that, and the other thing. But you have to learn first how to be a bartender. And it's not just pouring drinks and handling a crowd and figuring out how to make eye contact with people, let them know that they're gonna be attended too soon, you know, when, the, when there's like a busy night at the bar but also just sort of embodying the personality of the bartender, which is kind of the person in the room who sets the tone and the rules. You're like, in a certain way, you're like the president, yeah. uh, but you're the president of the bar. And um, my first bartending job was at the Blue Lamp, which, you know, in a way is really on the outside border of the Tenderloin, Tender Knob. It's on Geary, right? Between Taylor and Jones. Um, but it was part of a social ecology that came up from the Tenderloin very much. Um, many of the regulars there were people who lived in the single resident occupancy hotels um, on Geary and also below there, you know, on Leavenworth, the streets around there. And people would come into the bar, sometimes in their pajamas, um, because they lived that close by. And it was a sort of living room where yeah. people could congregate. And it also comprised sort of like one locus on what I mentioned in the book as a circuit of bars in the Tenderloin. And so even as I was stationary, because I was there pouring drinks, some of my regulars coming in had just been at the Driftwood. They'd just been at the Coral Sea or Joan L's or Cinnabar. And now some of my memories of these places have faded somewhat, but at the time, these bars start to take up residence in your imagination, even if you aren't regular there yourself, because your regulars who spend their whole life in bars, and let's just bracket like the subject of alcoholism for a minute, this is still, a real cultural history and social world of people who live um, in these places and they all know one another. Yeah. And I think maybe one important aspect of that is that um, people had credit at these bars as they did at the Blue Lamp. And I think that there was a sense of community and sympathy and compassion for regulars understanding that people were going to get their check at a certain date so they could drink on credit until that date and be safe and be inside and um it's a bit cheers like i guess but truly i did know everybody's name yeah i mean that's the Tunderline has so many like kind of public living rooms because the sros don't have them um and yeah, there's a real sense of camaraderie and supporting each other and um, sense of family for sure. But also like a pretty specific set of social mores and rules that yeah. I- Oh, absolutely. There's had, like a code. <laughs> yeah, a lot of codes that I had to learn and um, I was really interested in learning them. I think that lifelong I've been the kind of person who takes a certain enjoyment in the challenge of being kind of suddenly plunged into an environment where the codes that you need to learn to excel in that environment to do well 
are not things that you can read about in books or have quickly explained to you. You have to absorb them. Like the social codes were finely nuanced in a lot of ways. And I kind of loved being the, I don't know, the, the unschooled one who other people took pleasure in explaining things to, or even if they were dismissive to me, which they were, um, I liked that because I wanted to learn from them and for them to be the experts at their world to which I was being initiated. Yeah, um, well, if you could just give a sense of like what it was like to be there for someone like me that didn't ever get to go. Um, like, you know, what were like the most popular drinks and how many nights were there live music and things like that? Sure. Well, maybe I could start out by saying like, um, so when I got my job um, at the Blue Lamp, a woman named Ramona Downey was the bar manager. And um, I walked into that bar on an unseasonably hot day in San Francisco. And we know how rare those are. And when it's a hot day in San Francisco, it feels like something really special is going to happen, either to you or generally. And that special thing could be cataclysmic, like an earthquake, or it could simply be that you meet your destiny in the form of a new life as a bartender in the Tender Knob. And on a very hot day in San Francisco, I went downtown looking for a job with, you know, my just silly resume. I had very little um, experience doing anything. I had a college degree. There was a global recession. It was maybe like 1991. And um, it was hard to find employment. The other problem with finding employment for me was that I didn't really want a job. Um, I didn't want a regular job. And I ducked out of the sunlight and into the darkness of this bar. And there was a woman behind the bar wearing a fedora with a feather in it. And I felt like I had stepped into not a specifically different era. I didn't know what year it felt like in that bar, but a different plane of reality. And I immediately fell in love with the place. And I asked Ramona um, if she was hiring and I don't think she was, but she said, we will try you out, we'll try you out. And um, my first shift there was the morning shift. I don't remember what time it started, but pretty early, at least for me. So when I got to the bar and the Swamper Jerry was unlocking the doors to let people in, there were already people waiting outside. And those were people, I think, who were biding their time with packaged liquor between the time that uh, bars stopped serving at 2 a.m., 1.45, and the time when bars in that neighborhood would open again. Um, so people were a little shaky and kind of in a rush to get their drinks, but they also were perfectly fine telling me how to make their drinks. So the morning shift was like a great place to be in the laboratory of learning and they all drank different things. Um, you know, there was a guy who drank Galliano. And do you remember what Galliano is in a huge, tall bottle, almost like, like the pepper grinder at an old fashioned Italian restaurant or the olive oil bottle you see on the wall that never gets opened. It was four feet tall. Maybe Galliano is in a Harvey wall banger. I can't remember. I sometimes have anxiety dreams where I'm being asked to bartend now and I can't remember how to make the drinks. Moreover, the drinks that people make now are much more complicated. Um, but even for me then, you know, people would say, grab the bottle by the neck and turn it upside down, you know, pull up and then pull down. And that is one shot. These things you have to learn. And then once you know them, you feel like an athlete or something because it's a very, it's a physical job and to do it well and pour drinks quickly, you have to be in control of your body and have balance and all this stuff. Anyway, so I started out in the morning and um, it was just me and the bar back, Jerry. And so it was a quiet time at the bar um, and I really cherished it. Um, and then eventually they started letting me 
bartend at night. You have to be more seasoned to do that. It's busier. Um, Ramona, I believe, was the one who instituted the entire tradition of having live music at the Blue Lamp. There may have been a blues jam that preceded her, but I'm not certain about that. By the time I got there, she was doing, she was the booking manager and doing live music at night. And it was still relatively new, such that there was this kind of like witching hour uh, between the late afternoon regulars, like the hardcore tenderloin crowd and the people who were coming for live music. And it was different every night, the crowd, depending on who was booked there. You know, we had like, we had metal bands, we had punk bands, we had uh, some kind of like classic big bands like Leve Smith and her Red Hot Skillet Liquors. Um, we had like old timey music um, with skiffle drum and instruments. And, you know, so it just depends on the night, but, um, that crowd was always gonna be a different crowd than the regulars. And the two of them meeting, it was, it's almost like the freshwater outlet to the sea and this strange <laughs> like brackish mix. But in a certain way, they understood each other. And you would see like my regular Rick who drank Bacardi 151 and pushed a walker and just quite frankly fell down a lot and was like a very serious alcoholic. Him sort of telling somebody to get out of his way who was like a hipster with purple hair. Um, it was just a funny mix of people who kind of tolerated one another. And by the end of the night, sometimes if it was a really rocking band, there were people dancing and the regulars were dancing with these like hipsters from the mission who were there to see their friend's band play. Yeah, that reminds me so much of Aunt Charlie's, which is my favorite Tenderloin bar where I'm a regular. And there's the afternoon Tenderloin crowd and then people that come for the drag show. And it's so fun to be part of both crowds and then to see some of the regulars. Sometimes they leave, but sometimes they stick around for the show. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, the people that like put on the show like and some of the younger, younger crowd, like love the elders and like are, are very like excited when they stay and there's like a real camaraderie and respect there yep. i mean that happens sometimes but there was now i'm remembering a little more i mean gosh i wish i had a camera and could watch the scenes i saw as bartender because every night it was an epic movie that i somehow got to participate in and watch but Sometimes there was camaraderie and sometimes there was frustration. Like the regulars from the daytime were just like, who the hell are all these people? And why do I have to wait to get a drink in my own bar? And sometimes there was a strange um, overlapping of two different planes of reality that almost seemed not to be able to talk to each other. Like the regulars didn't even see what was going on. They would just push their way to the bar and sit down and have a drink. I mean, I had some regulars in there who had been going to that bar for years and years and years and were just such extreme personalities, always the same. There was a cook uh, who worked at one of the big hotels downtown, very much a cook and not a chef, if you know what I'm saying. Like he was a workaday dude. He was from Brittany, which is very specific, um, you know, to, to be from Brittany is a kind of part of it's people, the French look down on people from Brittany. And um, he had the same joke that he would perform every single night in the bar, which was, I am lesbian. <laughs> and he just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. You know, like, I love women. I am lesbian. Anyway. Like he had just learned that word. <laughs> um, so in the hard crowd, you write I never wrote about most people from the blue lamp. The bar is gone. The main characters have died. Um, and we've already talked about it a bit, um, but who were those main characters? And you, you write about some of them, you know, Tommy and Bobby and Jer and Johnny. Um, and are there any like main characters from the blue lamp that, that did not make it into the hard crowd and why? 
Oh, many. I mean, there's so many people from that time. And one thing that I mentioned in the book, you know, in regard to this is that I've never written about the blue lamp. Um, I mean, it's kind of mentioned glancingly in my most recent novel, The Mars Room. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's not totally accurate to say I've never written about it, but I've really never dug into that world and my experience there as the bartender. And I was trying to reflect on why that is. And as I say, maybe it's because I'm not finished sort of sorting and tallying what that experience was. I think that writers, by the time they turn to a subject, there's some distance that is installed in the act of writing. And I maybe wasn't ready to install that distance. Um, some of the people that I think about a lot from the Blue Lamp are the guys who played in the Sunday afternoon blues jam. That was a kind of special group of people. Um, the leader of that blues jam, I believe his name was Bobby. He was charming and also kind of impossible, um, very much of an egoist. And he had this cordless electric guitar that um, he sometimes utilized the freedom of that to run outside and perform his solo uh, on Geary Street in front of the bar. He did that once in the pouring rain and came back in and said, I shocked the hell out of myself because he's playing an electric guitar in the rain. Um, his bass player was named Patrick and Patrick had a girlfriend or wife named Maureen and they were my regulars. And I often wonder what happened to them. Um, they were very cool people. Uh, Patrick reminded me of like, he was like a Tom Waits, but not famous, you know? And maybe in the way that like, Tom Waits is very distinct and special for a lot of reasons, but among them that he is a kind of meta Tom Waits and he's also very much Tom Waits in the sense that he's kind of performing the role of this sort of cultural character who's seen everything and has a kind of, you know, like rough street poetry quality to him, but he's also outside of that. So there's a knowingness to it. And like Patrick from the Blues Jam was kind of like our very local version of that. He was handsome and glamorous and soulful, like he should have been famous, but was also, to my mind, caught up in some of the, you know, the, there are reasons why people end up living in the Tenderloin in these hotels. Um, you know, they get caught up in, in the drug culture down there and I think it's hard to get out of, but there were also some very talented people who lived down there and it really, it really was um, a community. So yeah, so I think of him and his wife and um, different people who would come in who just, treated me like family or something. Um, also some, I made some notes on this. Hold on, if you don't mind, if I. Oh yeah. Um, so Ginger Coyote, who was a kind of punk personality in San Francisco, um, her band, the White Dress Debutantes played at the Blue Lamp a lot. And those were kind of special, really fun nights, but also Ginger, you know, um, promoter extraordinaire as she was, she would do her flyering uh, like on the days leading up to the show and would kind of come in to the bar in the afternoons to take a rest, have a soft drink. Um, and then we would gossip. And because I grew up in San Francisco and my brother was in the punk rock scene, I'd known who she was since I was, you know, 10 years old. And I remember seeing her at the Mab and at the on Broadway and these different clubs. And um, we had a lot of fun together, just talking. Ginger was, you know, to me, she was part of that culture. And I've actually gotten back in touch with her since um, the excerpt from the hard crowd appeared in the New Yorker. And then she read it and we both just thought, oh my God, the blue lamp. I mean, there's just few of us left to remember that time. Also in her band, 
was a guy um, named Dave Matheson, who I've lost touch with a long time ago, who played guitar. And he had been um, the gas station attendant at, I think it was a Union 76 station at the corner of 7th and Irving. That gas station's no longer there. When I was growing up, I'm from the inner sunset. And my next door neighbor, Jeannie Hicks, uh, was his girlfriend and that was her first boyfriend. And we all spent a lot of time together. And he was like this kid who worked at the gas station. And then suddenly he was, you know, this guy in this really flamboyant band, like wearing spandex and feathers the way they all did. They wore costumes. Um, they had one singer, this very beautiful woman who wore bikini bottoms. And then she put a very long haired wig in between her legs which was a very funny gesture because it was like she had like very long and luxurious pubic hair. Like they were, you know, they were a really exciting, funny band. We did uh, get in touch with Dave Glass um, at your recommendation, who actually has a really beautiful photo in the Tenderloin Museum uh, of the block the museum is on. Um, yeah, I mean, however, you, if you want to show those photos and I can, if any thoughts come to mind. Sure. We have Johnny Nitro. Right, that's Johnny Nitro. I've seen that photo before. Um, that definitely evokes the blue lamp for me. It's funny because the piano is there in the background. Maybe we still did have a piano <laughs> and I've simply forgotten as much. So that lamp, actually, I think that might've even been my lamp <laughs> that I brought in. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing him play there quite, he was a regular uh, performer for us. So it looks like that's his guitar player, his yeah. guitar player, who's also in the set. I don't remember that much about Johnny Nitro, except, you know, he, I think was a pretty hard living person. I think you can see that in his face. Um, but yeah, that's a beautiful photo. Yeah, I found those Dave Glass photos actually just Google it, Google imaging blue lamp many years ago. And uh, I was writing my novel, The Mars Room, much of which takes place in San Francisco. And uh, he's got a lot of really fantastic photographs of the Tenderloin and also of the sunset. And I just thought this guy is a fantastic photographer, kind of maybe not as well known as he should be. So yeah, that's Leve Smith. So they still very much regularly performed at the Blue Lamp when I was working there. And um, it was really exciting when they did for a lot of reasons. First of all, she's incredibly talented and so glamorous and has an amazing voice. And she had top notch musicians playing in her band. It was a multi set. Um, a multi-piece band. I don't remember. I mean, there might have been nine or ten people on stage. Um, they had a very um, passionate crowd. So when they played, the place was packed. Which also, you know, for us, you make really good money when you've got Lave Smith playing. But I think the most important thing about those nights when she and her band played was that she brought an old fashioned dignity to that bar that almost reinvented what it was right before my eyes. It was not a seedy place. It wasn't about alcoholism and destruction and the sadder aspects of what it was like to work there somehow vanished in the face of this glamorous woman who was a very serious musician who brought almost like she traveled with her era, like it was 1923 when she walked into the bar and she brought that dignity into the room. I want to mention maybe if it's okay, just to add um, about, about the people who came in there. Um, because I'm from the city, I also ran into people there uh, from my own childhood and life. And it was sort of like, like if you're looking for people, there's the ethos of staying in one place so they can find you rather than moving around so that you can find each other. And, you know, 
as bartender, you're in one place. So the streams of people that would pass through, just the transience of it, you know, depending on who's playing or what's happening in that person's life, people would come and go like they're moving through the city on their own geometry. And I'm here in this one point. And um, so for instance, like a friend of mine from childhood uh, would come in a lot because she'd ended up living in the Tenderloin and was working the streets and what had been my best friend. So there I was for her. Um, in this different guise and she could come in and we could hang out there. Um, then I also had friends, we'd all gone to junior high together. I had other friends from junior high, Herbert Hoover Middle School, class of whatever, 1981. Um, <laughs> uh, I had other friends from junior high who became quite serious musicians. Um, like there's a bass player named Dana Schechter and she had different bands. Now she's in the Black Swans and um, another couple of bands, very like well-known celebrated musician. And they would come in and she was playing with this guy, Rick, who we all went to junior high together and they were these really cool musicians. And it just kind of makes you feel like, oh, there's, um, I don't know, a coherent history here and community. And it includes this place. I was the booking manager for a, a time after, so Ramoni Downey, who'd hired me and was the original booking manager. And really she was the impresario who kind of made the Blue Lamp into something a bit more than just one more bar uh, in that circuit. She left to start her own club, Bottom of the Hill, which oh. I believe is still is. in operation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I took over that job at a certain point. Um, I think I was kind of more excited about having this cool business card that said, you know, Blue Lamp, Rachel Kushner, booking manager, call 863-BLUE. <laughs> then I was about the actual responsibilities of the job because you had to be kind of detail-oriented, administrative, and secretarial to do a good job. I don't think I was that great at that. It was also a bit stressful because it was on you if somehow you didn't follow up and confirm with a band. Um, and if you leave a night open and there's no band, then the bartender working that night is going to make like one tenth of what they were counting on making. So everybody is relying on you to keep, you know, keep business flowing through the blue lamp. Um, but, uh, I don't know, um, some bands were really happy to play there. Other bands, maybe they didn't have a good experience there and you couldn't get them to come back. So it was neat just to see the people who were who were interested in, in, in the Blue Lamp. Um, so I think I only had that job for about a year. I probably took it on because you got an extra salary for doing it. I mean, I needed the money, I was broke. Um, but to be honest, I sort of just preferred being the bartender who got to work the good shifts, which is like Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, yeah. than, than being the, the booking manager. But I did do that for a while. That business card's beautiful. I have a matchbook too of the blue lamp I can show you as well. Um, I heard that you have a matchbook. Maybe my yeah. Mrs. Katie forwarded me that. I can, uh, here we go. <laughs> that's the one we have that's in our matchbook book. Oh, wow. I mean, that may have preceded my time there. I don't remember I think, it, but it's I think beautiful. it's pretty old based on this old kind of phone number. Um, well, that, so the light motif of the lamp that's on the right, that was on the sign that hung over the door. Yeah, that sign is beautiful. Um, yeah, we actually did have, um, so the first third of the hard crowd is framed through a ride down Market Street. Um, uh, which is a video that we cherish at the Tenderloin Museum as evidence of the wealth of neon in San Francisco. It's actually San Francisco Neon is our, um, we're their fiscal sponsor and they're the ones that put that video on YouTube. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And the Blue Lamp had a beautiful neon sign. And um, what would you say is uh, neon's impact on the aesthetic of the bar or how it kind of colors your memories or experiences there? 
Um, or like how does a neon sign or matchbook evoke history? Um, or if there are any other kinds of objects and relics like that that you think more evoke the Blue Lamb's history? Yeah. Um, I think we had a neon sign inside the bar also, but nice. my memory of it is hazy. Probably seeing that neon sign from outside is what made me want to go into the place. I mean, just growing up in San Francisco, I was somebody who felt like there was great mystery to be discovered in places that advertise themselves with neon. Um, as I say in the book, neon is a noble gas, whatever else that means, it suits that, that stretch of film um, traveling down Market Street. There is a certain nobility and mystery to neon. I mean, even in the kind of, I guess more like frumpy inner sunset of the late seventies and early eighties, there was some neon that felt like the way it glows in the fog is sort of special. Um, I don't know about other aesthetics um, of the bar itself. I mean, I wish I could see more photos of the interior to remind me. We did not have a piano, even though, you know, we were called the Blue Lamp Piano Bar. And um, there had originally been a piano in that bar, but it had been gone for a long time by the time um, I worked there. That's incredible. Um... I, I myself am really fascinated by like the life experiences people draw from to write fiction and reading the hard crowd, you really get a sense that you drew from the landscape of the Tenderloin to create fiction, particularly the Mars room. Um, and as someone who loves both the Tenderloin and your writing, that was extremely exciting. And I'm curious about if the characters in your novels are based off of specific people in the essays or there's specific incidences that made it into your novels, or if it's more of an amalgamation of people and experiences? I think the, these are great questions. Um, I tend to write people who are more amalgamations and invented and almost can ventriloquize parts of my own personality, parts of personalities of people I've admired and are nothing like me, um, drifts of experience that I've had. The Mars Room, I would say, has the most life that is intimate to my own experience in it. Um, because it's fiction and should stand as that, I'm a bit hesitant to sort of, you know, make a schema of like, oh, so this part is based on this and that part's based on that real thing. But when you read it, you know, it conjures the sunset and also Civic Center and the Tenderloin in a way that is true to my experience and really precedes um, my adulthood when I was working at the Blue Lab. I mean, I moved to San Francisco at the age of 10, so I'm not a native native. Um, but maybe in a certain sense, having the place be alien to me allowed me to see it in a particular way. And like, you know, the first week of school in sixth grade, I became friends with a girl who asked me to go down to Civic Center with her to find her much older half sister, who frankly uh, was working the streets down there. And so my introduction to the Tenderloin came very early. Um, and then as a teenager, a girl on my blog who was a good friend got a job at that Kentucky Fried Chicken on Eddy Street. Um, I think it's Eddy and Taylor, is that right? Um, There's still one at like Eddy and Polk about, but... Maybe not at the corner. I think it's the same one. Um, I think it's still there as, and I mentioned that in the essay in the book and I say it gets withering Yelp reviews, but what, do, <laughs> but what do people expect? You know, I mean, it's kind of sweet in a way that they are reviewing the KFC on Eddie and they're upset about the customer service there, the etiquette or that the napkins haven't been refilled. Um, my friend Jeannie worked at that KFC 
And, you know, kind of like when you work at those places, you get a feel for the neighborhood. I mean, if being a bartender is like being the president of the bar, even if you're at a fast food venue, which I've worked at many myself, um, you're kind of, you're the person who's setting the tone in the room. There isn't like a security guard, you know, you have to deal with people and what goes on in the neighborhood and you become friends with regulars and et cetera. So I was kind of introduced to that world through her. In my, I guess maybe when I was about 20 or 21, um, I briefly dated a guy who had been a student at the San Francisco Art Institute. And um, he was in the, he wanted to make movies and he was in George Kushar's class. I don't know if you guys know, you know, the famous filmmaker, George Kushar. Absolutely. And George, George's class was like a party and he oh. would provide uh, beer and pizza. So like some of us would go to that class who had no interest in becoming artists or making art. I mean, I was pure bohemian, just living in the moment. The idea of having like goals and aspirations that just seemed completely square to me. But I went to George's class because it was like this wild party and he would just turn on the camera. And some of what I think people got from that class was to, to, to draw from the color that's already existent in real life and put it into art. So the guy that I was dating, who was a student of George Kushar, he wanted to make a movie at the Hotel Hurley, which was like quite infamous SRO in the Tenderloin. And he and his kind of rich friend, the guy that I was dating was from a very, very, you know, impoverished background. He had nothing. He was like practically homeless. But he had this friend who was a rich guy who was buying all the good camera and sound equipment. And they rented a room at the Hotel Hurley and they had actors down there and they were sort of recreating this romanticized idea about the tenderloin. And the movie was about the guy who is in love with the prostitute, not the John, but the sort of, you know, by structure cuckolded romantic oh, yeah. figure He's who's gonna waiting save her. for her. Yeah. Sorry? He's going to save her. Right. Well, also, yeah, he's, he's, he's jealous and in pain because but also living off the money that she's bringing back. So it's this sort of morally compromised and tragic position. And his movie was called Tenderloins. So they rented a room and got art school actors to be in it. And they set up all this camera equipment at the Hotel Hurley, mind you. And they started the shoot and halfway through their first shoot, somebody broke down the door pistol whipped everybody in the room and stole everything. And to me, I guess, you know, I don't like to draw crude moral lessons from things. Nonetheless, it was like they wanted to take a bite out of the tenderloin for their own art and they got bit hard. Yeah. So, um, you write, to be hard is to let things roll off of you, to live in the present, not to dwell or worry. Why write about the hard crowd? How is grasping at the hard, the fleeting, in the present history that exists in the Tenderloin uh, shaped your worldview and your craft? Well, it's not writing about it that's shaped my worldview. It's that um, I write about my own life and the people I've known. Um, I, I think it's hard to quantify these things, but people are like movie stars to me. I mean, just regular people in my life. I've always been kind of drawn to exciting people and maybe I've just been rich in that, in that I've encountered a lot of really interesting people. And um, it's not like I sought out the quote unquote hard crowd. Um, I, you know, I just am from the city and um, there's a world that I lived in and had a part in and was also an observer to that I'm starting to realize more and more is somewhat unique. And um, I say that based on the reactions that I got to that essay when it was excerpted in a magazine and a lot of people who read it reached out to me and said, 
wow, you really did it. Like, thank you for telling my story also, because it is a time and a cast of characters and a feeling and a world that's sort of unbelievable to people who didn't live it. So those of us who did live it actually stopped talking about it to people who didn't because they don't understand what you're saying. And sometimes they even think you're making it up. So why bother? Um, but when I have total control, like I did with that essay and kind of caught the stream of this feeling of tallying and sorting what's completely vanished, but still occupies a pretty big role in my own thoughts and experiences just in the daily. Um, it, was, it was satisfying to figure out a way to make that into uh, an essay. But like in terms of there being a hard crowd, it, I like that phrase. Um, it comes from a cream song, White Room, that I listened to a lot as a kid. I heard it from older people who ran this head shop on Hay Street called the White Rabbit. Um, so sometimes these things just become nodes in your own mind of how to like define things later or put a sort of envelope around a feeling and a time. And I met a lot of different people uh, growing up who I would consider to be hard. Um, and hard doesn't, it's not a pejorative at all, but it's also not a kind of romanticizing. It just, my favorite phrase lately is it is what it is. Cause I, you know, I, I don't know how else to say things sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the Tenderloin Museum is dedicated to Tenderloin history. And I mean, I would say that the hard crowd is also an essay on Tenderloin history and that it's nonfiction that takes place in the Tenderloin in the past. And museum really strives to give voice to people and places that are often left out of history books and to tell more of their personal stories as opposed to what you'd read in in headlines and do you feel like tenderline history is important and why oh so important yes i mean the more we talk the more i wish i could remember all the details of the various people i've known over the years um who also you know can claim a share in that history, but it's a very vital part of the city. I mean, you know, I'm not the expert on this, but there were a lot of um, really vibrant immigrant communities that took residence in the Tenderloin too, Vietnamese people, Laotian people, Cambodian people, um, you know, so that if you just land in the city, it's a place where you can afford um, something to rent. And also, in the first wave of the dot-com era in the 90s, I left San Francisco around that time and moved to New York City. And that was, you know, people were really pushed out of housing. So it was very swift. And I, many friends of mine could seek refuge in the Tenderloin because it was still um, affordable. I would like to think that places like the Blue Lamb and maybe like this speaks of a generalized phenomenon in the Tenderloin is that it is a community that in its own way is about safe harbor. There are places in the Tenderloin where people could go and feel accepted and safe that is not offered to them in any other part of the city. I mean, there were people who came into the Blue Lamp who I would like to think were offered safe harbor there. Um, but when I say safe harbor, I'm also acknowledging that there was great danger to these people in and outside of the Tenderloin, but that some of the businesses and community resources in the Tenderloin could work to protect people. There was a woman who was a regular to my shifts uh, at the bar, the Blue Lamp, who was transgender and um, would come in in the afternoon and had a kind of exquisite poise to her. Like she was Kim Novak. She was my Kim Novak in the 90s. And you know, San Francisco was really very proudly, I think, at the vanguard of like new gender politics. And um, we were all versed in that and blessed and early. So, you know, to me, it was completely normal to have this glamorous woman sitting at the bar. 
but I also saw her um, experience great violence and it's painful to think about. But when she came into the bar, it was a safe harbor for her. And same with my friend Thomas Wanger, who ended up murdered. I would like to think that the bar was safe harbor for him. And that maybe that the Tenderloin is about that in a sense, in terms of its community resources, it's about accepting people and providing them dignity and safety. Absolutely. It has throughout its entire history as well been a safe haven for those that don't fit into society's mainstream and lots of different incarnations. And it's also the people have fought for their right to exist um, from, you know, the powers that be throughout its entire history. And that's a history we really showcase at the museum. And anytime you're in the Tenderloin, please, please come by. We'd love to have you. I will. I will take you up on that offer soon. And anytime you want to go to Aunt Charlie's also, or Janelle's is still open, let me know. Let's do it together. Yeah.